morning. Happy New Year and welcome to the Shanker Private Client Group Accountant Attorney Winter Webinar Series. This program is entitled Estate Planning for 2022, What to Advise Clients After the Tax Roller Coaster in Washington. For those who don't know me, my name is Jonathan Shankman. I'm a financial advisor, portfolio manager, and an accredited investment fiduciary at Oppenheimer based in New York City. The goal of all my programs is to bring professionals together to help them better serve their clients. This is done by educating attendees on the latest topics in wealth planning and by encouraging collaboration between a client's attorney, CPA, and financial advisor where appropriate. My practice focuses on working with high net worth families, businesses, and not-for-profits. I manage individual investment portfolios, trust accounts, corporate retirement plans, and endowments to help my clients achieve their financial goals. In addition to the 25 or so events I run every year, I also do a fair amount of writing on the topics of investing and financial planning. You can read my work in the Barron's, CNBC, Forbes, Kiplinger, The Wall Street Journal, The CPA Journal, Trust and Estate Magazine, and many other periodicals. After the program, I'll send out a link to all the publications where I publish my work. Today, we're privileged to hear from my Tati, Martin Shankman, who is an attorney in private practice based in New York. Martin concentrates on estate and tax planning. He's a widely quoted expert on tax matters and is a regular source of numerous financial business publications and is author of nearly 50 books and approximately 1,500 articles. Martin was named by Worth Magazine as one of the top 100 attorneys, by CPA Magazine as one of the top 50 IRS practitioners. He's active in many charitable causes, including the founding chronicillnessplanning.org, which educates professional advisors on planning for clients with chronic illness and disabilities. Today, he'll be speaking on estate planning for 2022, what to advise clients after the tax roller coaster in Washington. With that introduction, I'll now turn the program over to Mark. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, and Happy New Year. Um, what we're going to do for the next hour, and we're not covering all the materials, is we're going to talk about planning uh, for 2022, interacting with clients, things we should tell clients, and some of the planning techniques and considerations of what we need to do now. Um, the general disclaimer is uh, usually I ignore it, but just the bottom point on slide two, we still don't know what's going to happen in Washington. I just read an article um, that someone just sent me this morning suggesting that there's not likely going to be any changes this year in the tax law. How do they know that? I don't think we know anything. So that's what I think we need to deal with, continued uncertainty. Before, before we start talking about 2022 specifically, let me just take a minute or two and talk about a couple of recent developments that I think are important to keep in mind in um, everything we do going forward this year and in the future. So first, there was a case that came out late last year called Smoldino. Um, you could dismiss the case, ah, another, another bad fact case, taxpayer did everything wrong. But I think that would be a mistake. If you haven't read the case, it's worth reading the case. Uh, it's not that hard of a read. Yes, the taxpayer did seemingly everything wrong, but that is almost, it almost presents a checklist of things that we have to do right. And I think what's also a concern in Smaldino for all of us is clients take shortcuts and those shortcuts are problematic. So in small Dino, if the taxpayer did eight things wrong, well, what if our client does four things wrong or five things wrong? What's the number before the plan implodes? And obviously, I think the answer is very simple, not, not generally achievable, but simple. We need to strive for perfection in getting all of the formalities of a plan dealt with. One of the things that was uh, an issue in small Dino, I guarantee is an issue in planning we've all done. And I've had the issue with clients. I pointed it out to clients and they've proceeded at their own risk. And, and logically so in a sense, because um, I don't think they had any choice given the tax environment. What was that? Mr. Smaldino gave LLC interest to Mrs. Smaldino. And the next day she turned around and gave him to a trust. The court uh, looked through that for a lot of reasons. We'll talk very quickly about a few of them and said it was really a gift by Mr. Smaldino to the trust. He had no exemption left, so there was a tax incurred. We all faced throughout 2020 and 2021 issues of step transaction uh, problems. Clients and all of us as practitioners were very concerned, gee, when is the law gonna get changed? What's the effective date gonna be for a lot of, especially 2021, there was an awful lot of talk about retroactive tax changes. And theoretically, it's still possible. If they pass something this year, uh, it could well be made retroactive to January 1, 2022. I'm, I'm not as concerned about that happening as I was last year, but you know, 
as it gets later in the year, it becomes less of a concern, but it's certainly a possibility. Right now, is anything going to pass early in January? I don't think so. <clears throat> it appears that Congress has turned its attention to voting rights and not uh, the Build Back Better and tax law, but we don't know. We don't know. But when clients made transfers um, to retitle assets between spouses and then quickly thereafter made ongoing transfers, caution the clients about the Smoldino case. Um, when you do gift tax returns for 2021 in 2022, I think you should give even more careful consideration to reporting gifts between spouses to try to toll the statute of limitations on them. It gives you another look back at the transaction to try to make sure the documentation is correct. Other things that were missed in Smaldino are issues that lots of clients face. The income tax returns and gift tax returns didn't uh, reflect the gift that was made from Mr. to Mrs. Smaldino. If she held the, the LLC interest for a day, there should have been a one day allocation on K-1s on the 1065 partnership tax return. There wasn't. You can't cut corners and expect it to work. So very valuable case. I think it's really important to take a look at. Um, and I think it's important to caution clients in writing, if you can, about the incredible importance of formalities. And oh, by the way, that's a critical reason, the Smaldino case, to encourage clients to come back in uh, in 2022 to review all the rushed planning in 2020 and 2021. It's been a whirlwind for most practitioners since I'd say almost April of 2020, excuse me. Excuse, excuse me. Excuse me. I should have cut the mic off too, forgive me. Um, but it's been a whirlwind of planning. We, we've had since early 2020 and all of 2021, rush, 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 because we don't know when the law is going to change. And that really hasn't changed. We still don't know what's going to happen. But there's no doubt that a lot of planning that was done was done quickly. And a lot of the formalities in Smaldino weren't overlooked necessarily because the client didn't want to do it right or we didn't want to do it right, but everybody was rushing. So take a look at the Smaldino case and go back and encourage all your clients from the last two years that you did work for, whether you're an accountant, an attorney, financial advisor, get them all in, talk to them, review everything. There was just a, a, a CCA uh, issued, literally it came out last, uh, the end of the last day of last year, which is why it's probably not on anyone's radar yet. I haven't seen anything written up about it, but it's a really important uh, pronouncement by the service. What happened in this pronouncement? Taxpayer was bad, but again, we have the same issue here, I think, that we did in, in the Powell case, the Cahill case, the Moore case. Um, you know, where do you draw the line? Just because the taxpayer is bad, can you be 50 degrees bad or and get and, and not get nailed? Do you have to be 58 degrees bad? It's very hard to draw the line. So this this CCA is a very significant warning. Um, to practitioners and clients. What happened? In a nutshell, very simplifying. Taxpayer had an appraisal of their company. And you're all going to relate to this scenario because you've all seen this repeated many a time. Taxpayer had a private company, had it appraised. Seven months later, they made a gift to a grad. While they were making the gift to the grad, they had already started discussions with a merger partner to merge the company. When they made the gift to the grant, they used the seven month old appraisal. Why might they have done that? Because like so many clients, I don't wanna spend the money and go through another appraisal. The appraisal was so expensive. It was so invasive having all those appraisers in my office. I don't wanna deal with it. And clients don't wanna deal with it. Now, the big problem here, and it should be almost, you should anticipate it from the, the brief description. The appraisal seven months earlier, did not indicate anything, did not factor in anything about a possible merger. The IRS came and said, hey, you have an appraisal that doesn't mention a significant known fact, the potential for a merger. That appraisal was not done in good faith. It doesn't meet the requirements of a qualified appraisal. Your calculation, your calculation of the annuity payment out of the GRAT is not a qualified annuity payment because it was based on a material uh, uh, intentional misstatement in the appraisal. 
you ignored a material fact that a willing buyer and willing seller, hypothetical willing buyer and willing seller, the gift tax standard would, would need to know. And therefore, they blew up everything. It wasn't just that the appraisal was no good, so the annuity payment had to be increased, putting more money leakage back into the estate. They said the annuity payment didn't qualify. What does that mean? It means that the entire value, the correct value, not the seven month old value, but the entire value based on the merger was deemed to be a gift to the trust with no offsetting annuity. That is a, a, a uh, in, in terms of a grat, the, the Armageddon of, of tax results, they blew up the entire grat. Now, number one, we need to be more careful to warn clients that they have to tell the appraiser, and if you're working as an appraiser or your firm is doing the appraisal, you must disclose all relevant facts. You can't hide something that significant. We all have clients that come in, and this is where this gets particularly nettlesome and worrisome. Clients come in and have some discussions ongoing about the sale of their company. And in fairness, in a lot of cases, they have no idea if the sale is going to ever go through. Depends how far down that continuum, right? Here we're just chatting, or here there's nothing going on. Here you have a completed sale. Where on the continuum are they? How much has to be disclosed? I think that if the appraiser has an honest assessment of the potential for a sale in the appraisal report, then what happened in the CCA can't happen because you've at least dealt with it. There may be a difference of opinion but the, the facts weren't hidden. What does this mean to practice? I think we have to be very careful to caution clients. You can't use an old appraisal if there's been a material misstatement or change in facts. I don't know that I would read this to say that, you know, across the board, a seven month old appraisal is automatically no good. If there's been no material change in the business, that's significant. With the yo-yo crazy economy and, and, and economics of what's going on with, with COVID, We've all seen clients where their business was down by 50%, up by 50% in value, huge valuation swings. To me, unlike anything I've seen in 40 years of practice, this CCA is a real concern. Another thing we have to do, when we do note sale transactions, a common approach to a note sale transaction is to have a spillover to um, an incomplete gift trust, a charitable uh, uh, bucket, like a, a donor advised fund, the watch for UBIT issues, or a grat. Those are some of the common spillover issues. Be careful using a Q-tip. That raises a whole bunch of issues and probably shouldn't be done. But spillover to grat is a very common tool. Will that work? I would like to think so, but maybe not. Because when does the grat in a spillover define value mechanism, like the Christensen case, where if there's a valuation adjustment, instead of like Wandry, where just a dollar value sold, the dollar value sold, but the excess instead of remaining with the taxpayers pours into a grant. If the, the only way the grant has substantive funding, and you may want to um, have some nominal funding in all events so the grant can be functional and make an annuity payment each year, even before an audit adjustment. The only way that grant and the spillover gets funded is if there's a valuation adjustment. That valuation adjustment may then raise the very issue in the CCA, does the GRAT work? I think I'm going to go back and try to identify clients that we've done spillovers into GRATs and caution them about the impact of the CCA, that this may suggest that the planning doesn't work. I would hope that's not the case, but I think I'd rather caution clients about the CCA and the potential issue. So. While we're planning this year, you need to think of that. I'm gonna skip the next topic just for time. It's just the, the rev proc that lists the no ruling areas. Uh, Ings, for example, incomplete, uh, incomplete non-grantor trusts are, are beat its. These have been on the, on the hit list of the IRS, uh, sort of the cautionary that we're not gonna issue rulings on them for a long time. So let me, let me change gears. That's just a quick update. Those points that I just made need to be factored into all the planning we're doing in 2022. That's why I added them. Um, and I think each one of those two topics uh, deserves its own webinar because they're really significant issues. Um, the next issue is a soft topic. I won't spend a lot of time on it. It's not technical, but I just think it's got to be mentioned. 
we, we, all of us collectively, accountants, attorneys, financial advisors, insurance consultants, all of us in the, in the uh, allied professions of estate and tax planning have been like chicken little, you know, the estate tax sky is falling, the estate tax sky is falling, right? The grant or trust uh, are, are gonna be eliminated. The exemption is gonna be decreased dramatically. Uh, deemed realization events, all the stuff that, that Congress uh, and Holland and Sanders and, and others, have, Pascrell, have been proposing for the last 18, 20 months. You know, every time there's a new proposal, we've all cautioned clients, you better plan, you better plan, because, oh my gosh, look what's going to happen, right? Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Um, so far, nothing's happened. Uh, my impression is that a lot of clients think, hmm, ain't nothing going to happen. The House bill had no significant tax changes that affect estate planning directly other than the surtax, which we're going to talk about, because that has some important implications. And I think we need to start having a dialogue with clients about that now. But the question is, after 18, 20 months of telling clients that the estate tax sky is going to fall and nothing's happened, how do we get clients to talk to us? How do we get clients back in the office? Uh, first, I think an awful lot of clients that were willing to do planning have done the planning. Right, we were all working under tremendous pressure, um, pushing clients, encouraging clients, guiding clients, and trying to get planning done before some unknown effective date of new laws. I.e., let's get the planning done immediately because we don't know when the law may change, and nothing's happened. I think clients are suffering from what I would call uh, uh, planning fatigue. I don't think a lot of clients want to hear from us, frankly. And I think if we called up clients and said, you know, uh, the uh, exemption amount has gone up. You can put another 90 grand into your trust. I think if we call clients and, and tell them, you know, you didn't quite finish all the planning, we can make a few more gifts. I'm not sure clients are really uh, receptive to that right now. And I think we need to change our dialogue. Now, one of the pieces of dialogue that I think is essential, tell clients about this Smaldino case. There was just a case that absolutely hammered the taxpayers because formalities were not adhered to. All your planning in 2020 and 2021 was done in an incredible rush. Let's make sure that what you did and all the hassle you went through and the cost you incurred, let's, let's just have a meeting and go through all the documentation and the backup and make sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's crossed. Because if you don't do that based on Smoldino, the whole thing may implode. I think that kind of reach out to clients will have some success because I don't think clients want to see every all the hassle and expense they incurred in the past two years uh, not succeed, especially if you give them uh, a brief discussion or, or, or heads up on the Smaldino case where, where that happened. And to me, the, the ideal way to reach out to, to advisors, I'm sorry, to clients is, is, is part of an advisory team. If I'm reaching out in the Smaldino case, really stresses this. As an estate planning attorney, I can't reach out to the client and really do the job if I don't have the accountant involved, right? Because it made it very clear in the Smaldino case that the gift and income tax returns had to be consistent with the planning. And too often the accountants aren't informed by the lawyers or just with all the pressure we were all under in the last two years, maybe just something dropped. We want to make sure the accountants know all the facts and have all the relevant documents for their permanent file. If you, if the accountant is preparing the gift tax return or worked on it, not just the lawyer, you got to have the accountant involved. Most lawyers aren't preparing income tax returns. Some do, but I think in most cases, if you don't involve the accountant and the lawyer together, you're not going to pick up all these issues. And the wealth advisor has to be involved. You know, do they have an investment policy statement for the new trust? Have they uh, reassess the investment allocation. We have to talk to the investment advisors about the new surtax and what that may mean. So I think a big part of the strategy for clients going forward is, hey, we've got to go back, circle back, and make sure everything's in order. I've slowly started to do that, and I'm going to make a concerted effort over the next month or two to do that for every client we've done work for for the last two years, because 2020 was a crazy year, and then in 2021, we didn't have the time to really do all of that because we were still busy doing planning for clients that didn't do it in 2020. Um, another and a different approach, which I, I started actually at the end of last year, uh, after we finally got all of our year-end deadline work done, I've started reaching out to clients that have not done any planning because an awful lot of clients just didn't want to deal with it. Um, surprising to me, but 
that's just the reality. And I've emailed those clients and even some clients we did, you know, substantive tax oriented planning for and said, hey, you know, we've never looked at your, your wills and powers of attorney and all your basic or core documents. Can we set up a time and go through that and see what you have and where you are? One client emailed me that he had other counsel do it, you know, only a couple of years ago and he doesn't want to change it. And a number of clients have told me, yeah, you know what, you're right. My stuff is 15 years old. Um, I've never had you look at it. Let's, let's go through it. So I think another way to get clients in the door, especially those that did nothing, uh, and even some that have planning fatigue on tax oriented planning, go back to the, the basic core planning. Let's update your basic documents. I know in my office, we've done very little of that for the last two years because we just didn't have the bandwidth given how much tax oriented planning there was. And I think that's another way to reach out to clients. Um, so the point is, I think that we have to change our, our approach. And I think it's protective to us as practitioners to get clients back in. And those are a few thoughts on it. On the next couple of slides, there's a few more. Now, let me change gears again. And let me just kind of set the stage talking a little bit about what's going on uh, over the last 20 months um, and what that means to some of what we also need to do now. And, and by the way, in, in this next discussion is a third and different way, very different approach of what we have to talk to clients about now and what some clients may be very receptive to hear. But I think it's important to protect us that we communicate to clients. So for the last 18, 20 months, it's like been almost every month, there's been another tax proposal. I feel every time I've done a lecture, I have to rewrite it because the, the, the game keeps changing because uh, there's a new proposal or something else happens. Um, we know that the Build Back Better passed by the House has nothing in the way of harsh estate tax changes, but we don't know what the Senate's going to do. So we're still in the same quandary we've been in terms of advising clients that we have no solid advice to give them. Um, I think that since we still have no idea what's going to be enacted, we're giving the same advice right now in early 2022 that we've done for the last 20 months. We don't know what may change. I think it looks less likely that we're going to have all these harsh tax proposals, but how do we know? We don't know what deal Mansion and Cinema may make uh, in order to um, feel that there's enough revenue, but raised in a way that they're comfortable with. We don't know. We don't know. And it's very possible that when they're looking for revenue numbers to offset a child tax credit or something else that, that's part of the Build Back Better that they want to do, that they dip into something like the Sanders plan, which is already in legislative language, pluck out something and uh, pop it into the bill. So it's almost like um, anything could be included. I did a webinar yesterday with uh, Jonathan Blotmacher and Bob Keebler, and Bob referred to uh, um, uh, what the tax bill may be as the bride of Frankenstein, meaning they, they could pull any of those ugly tax changes out of any of the proposals if they, they, the revenue scoring matches what they need and just pop it in. So we have no way of assuring clients that, that ugly stuff may not happen. We need, we, need to, we need to get planning done. I just don't think clients are gonna be particularly receptive. Um, those that haven't done all the planning they should or done no planning. And I think clients that have done a fair amount of planning are, are just gonna be tired of it. But that's what we still need to caution clients. We don't know, you gotta plan. Um, what planning should you consider with clients now? I think anything that you do in terms of planning, and this is really the same concept as last year, so I, I won't belabor it, Planning has got to make sense, right? Um, if you're making a gift to trust for children or grandchildren and you can't access it, why are you doing it? Do you have so much wealth that you're never, ever, ever, that's a lot of evers going to need to access it? Why not do a slat or even more significantly, why not do a variation of a slat like a spat or hybrid dapt or mix and match those types of trust to give more access? And if we have time, we'll, we'll get into that. But I think preserving access just like it was last year is really quite critical. What planning do you, what mechanisms do you still integrate into planning? Because we have no idea what's gonna happen. It's no different than last year. Will there be a retroactive tax change? I'm not feeling that there will be, but I don't know. So why on earth not build in a um, uh, plan for rescission, right? The, the ability to unwind a transaction if there's an unattended income tax consequence. 
why not continue to build as many of us did last year, disclaimer provisions into irrevocable trusts where either a primary beneficiary or the trustee can disclaim the transfers to a trust and thereby unravel the transaction. I think those same types of flexible mechanisms that could give you a, a safety valve if, if something happens still makes sense to do. Some practitioners, maybe many, I don't know, there's no surveys, uh, don't love those techniques. Some fear that if you put in a disclaimer mechanism, it may make, it may make the gift incomplete. I'm not sure that's the case. Uh, I, I don't know that I agree with the reasoning, but there's uncertainty with the steps we take to deal with uncertainty. But I think it's important to offer clients those options because you don't want a client to go through planning then, oh my, there's a retroactive tax change and now they're nailed. How likely do I think that is? Wild guess, 10% or less. But why on earth take the chance if you can, you can address it with a fairly simple provision? If you're an accountant or a wealth advisor and the estate planning attorney has died in your client, make sure that they're on, on you know, call them up privately without the client on the phone and have a talk with them. What, what mechanisms are you building into the documents so we can unravel this if something bad and unexpected happens uh, in Washington? And as I said on the bottom, uh, addressing uh, administration plans is absolutely key. And I talked about that in the Smoldino case. Um, before I go on to the next slide, let me pause here for a second. One of the other things I said, there's a third mechanism that comes out of what I'm talking about, a third approach to talking to clients in 2022 that we need to address. And it may be a way to get some clients that are uh, all planned out and don't want to deal with us anymore to at least have that conversation. And I think it's important. Many of the plans done in 2021, it's probably too late for 2020, but many of the plans done in 20. 21 had disclaimer provisions. It's too late for rescission. That has to be done in the same calendar year. But if there are disclaimer provisions or formula clauses, suggest to your clients that you need to review those or they should review them with you because a disclaimer only has nine months from the initial transfer to be uh, implemented. And that clock is running fast and may already be over for earlier 2021 transactions. So I think it's important to let clients know about that. So that, that's a third way along with the administration for Smoldino um, and dealing with core planning to get clients to take our calls and continue the planning process despite the fatigue or frustration they may have. And we all get it. I mean, I'd be frust I'm frustrated too, right? We're all frustrated. It's, it's rather unfair for 20 months to have no clue what, what the tax laws are gonna be. Um, on slide 16, I just gave you the current inflation adjusted amounts. You know, we all have to, I, it takes me a, a while to get my brain into the new numbers. So we, we all know 11.7 million was the exemption amount last year. It's now 12 million 60,000. And I said a few moments ago, that means every client can put another $90,000 of, of transfers. Now, some clients will appreciate hearing from you, can just have their wealth advisor wire from a personal non-qualified uh, account, 90 grand of, uh, or ACAT securities into their, their trust account without really any legal work. Uh, maybe have them do a gift letter. We like to do that just to document that, that, that a gift was intended to be made. Um, you may need a direction letter and maybe not if it's just marketable securities that the trustee is holding in the um, uh, uh, irrevocable trust account. So that's something we should alert clients to. Some will be happy to deal with it. I think most will ignore us. Um, gift tax exclusion, 16 grand, not 15, it went up by a thousand bucks. Um, I think that's really important, even though the, the amount may be inconsequential, a thousand bucks more per person, but lots of clients do crummy powers on their own. They're going to have forms that they've used from prior years that say 15 grand. If we don't say, hey, wake up, pay attention, it's 16, not 15, uh, they're going to lose out on that extra thousand dollars, and we should make sure they're aware of that. We should also make certain that, that if we have paraprofessionals in our office doing crummy powers, that they update all the forms and communicate with clients so that clients can make the full $16,000 gift. And we all know it, so I'll just say it quickly, but we've been talking about this for the last two years because even if there is no change in Washington, under current law, um, the exemption drops by half in 2026. So for anybody with an estate that's you know, over five to 10 million, 
uh, why on earth not use some of your exemption now? As long as it can be done in a way that you maintain access, it gives you good asset protection. And that's a fourth point, by the way, um, to use to get clients in. Need for asset protection does not change, right? We live in the most litigious society in the history of the planet. Nothing that happens in Washington is going to change that. That's just part of the American culture. We love to sue each other. It's you know, right after baseball, maybe that's the national pastime. So helping guide clients to do things like uh, irrevocable trusts and LLCs and layers of both uh, to protect their assets remains vital. And that's certainly part of the conversation we can have when we let clients know about the new exemption amounts. Um, so on slide 18, I talk about some of the things that were in the Build Back Better. Uh, again, we don't know what the Senate's gonna do in their version of the BBB. Um, and the BBB is now BB, back burner. So build back better, back burner. It's like the modern version of Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers, but the tax, state tax version of it. Um, the surcharge is really a significant point, and I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about that because it affects how we draft trust, how we plan, and what we may want to do. Um, salt deduction may be back. Um, I, 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 I'm kind of surprised what they're doing because it will benefit more wealthy people. They may cap it. We don't know. So obviously we can't plan on that uh, before we see what happens. Um, the surcharge from an income tax perspective is if your income is over 10 million, you have um, a 5% surcharge. And if it's over 25 million, another 3%. So it becomes an 8% surcharge. Now, I don't know how many people that'll affect uh, in the country, my, my guess is it's a very small percentage. You know, maybe every practitioner has a few people in their office with those kind of numbers, but um, I would think for most of us, it's, it's a limited number. But take a look at how they apply it to trusts. For a trust, once you have two, a mere 200 grand of income, 5% surcharge, 500 grand in income, another 3% for an 8% surcharge. Husband dies, sets up a typical credit shelter trust under his will, um, some stocks go in it, the stocks appreciate, surviving wife sells the stocks, bam, if there's no, if there's no further action taken, there's a potentially an 8% surcharge. How about the family home? There's still a lot of old estate plans set up before portability because the clients never came back and changed them. Or, or these trusts were funded before portability. It was very common to have the family home put into a credit shelter trust because they didn't have other non-qualified assets to fund it. And, you know, the home is sold, bam, you know, you could face an 8% surcharge on that. So planning for trust is really critical. And I think it's going to be a huge trap for the unwary because the, the clients that view themselves as not so wealthy or more simple in terms of their tax needs are not going to talk to their accountant or their investment manager before end a year and before they should do planning. And I know you have 65 days into the next year, but the bottom line is if they don't address this planning uh, because they don't realize it and their advisors are not on top of it and they may not have the information to be on top of it, these clients are gonna get nailed with potentially an 8% surcharge at a much lower rate. And in many cases, not all, but in many cases, it's easy to avoid that. And we're gonna talk about it. The 3.8% net investment income tax could have a lot of interesting ripple effects. So I just want to point that out real quick. Um, right now, it's very common for physicians and other advisors to structure their um, practices as S corporations. Take out, you know, thousand dollars a week in salary. I'm making up a number. Don't don't use that as as anything informative. Talk to your accountant. Get a reasonable comp analysis done. But they'll take out, say, $1,000 a week in salary. Everything else comes out as an S-corp distribution, and they avoid paying FICA on all that. Well, that game will be over based on the House bill if the Senate passes something like it. And um, the, way, the way that'll be over is all that income coming out of the S-corp is now going to be subject to a 3.8% NIT tax. That may mean that um, people restructure how their businesses are operated. They may start taking uh, income out as a salary, so they just get withholding and don't have to deal with estimated tax on these larger amounts uh, quarterly. Um, think about the ripple effects to buy-sell agreements and insurance funding. So if there's a formula to determine the value of a business, two doctors, and they have a formula based on income, if they start changing how they take their income out and it transmutes from uh, S-corp distributions to salary, it may completely wreak havoc with the for formula. 
So if this is in fact enacted, uh, we need to get to all these clients and review all their buy-sell agreements. If the buy-sell is insurance funded, that's gotta be looked at. So lots of ripple effects. My personal guess is um, that the House is gonna feel tremendous, I'm sorry, the Senate is gonna feel tremendous pressure to pass something um, politically. And I'm not making political projections, just, just a tax thought. Um, I would think that if the House was able to pass these tax surcharges and the net investment tax, those things are, I think, safe that, even though Manchin and Cinema indicated they didn't want tax increases, for some reason, those seem to not qualify as tax increases in their perspective. And those things will likely go through. What else will go through? I have no idea. And just keep in mind the plucking of some of these other harsh provisions that may well happen. It may, many of you remember, I, I can't remember the bill that was enacted in, but it was the pothole bill, uh, the something surface transportation act or something. And they plucked basis consistency out of one of the Sanders proposals because it was just in legislative form, threw it in because it was scored as generating enough revenue to pay for whatever pothole bill was passed. And you had this odd, really unworkable, remains unworkable basis consistency rule that I can't imagine generates any revenue, but it was scored to generate revenue and they plucked it. We may see plucking. So keep that in mind. Um, slide 19, under current... Um, circumstances, my understanding is, and I don't have the exact statistic, uh, it's just hearsay from speakers at different conferences over the years, but I seem to remember John Porter saying that less than 2% of gift tax returns are audited. If less than 2% of gift tax returns are audited, no question that a lot of clients and frankly, some practitioners were playing the audit lottery, right? There's such a little chance of audit, why not go for it? Um, trust income tax returns I hear from some practitioners that they never see an audit or trust income tax returns. If they infuse significant cash and they were talking 8 billion with a B a year into the IRS, apart from computer upgrades from far more matching, like everything will be matched, that gives the IRS enough of a war chest to go out and hire an army of auditors to go out and look at all the returns that have never been looked at. And you know, maybe anybody that's got an income over a million dollars, five million, some number, not only might they audit income tax returns, they may send out teams of audits to do a holistic audit where they look at their entity returns, flow through entities in particular, you know, 1065s, 1120s, uh, trust income tax returns, gift tax returns, and correlate all of it. Um, so the, the audit lottery game that a lot of our clients have wanted to play, even when we advise them against it, that could be a really risky gambit if the funding goes through. And obviously there's lots of different views on, on what might happen with that. So let's change gears and talk about this uh, trust income tax surcharge, because I think you know, the topic is what do you do in 2022? These are things you may wanna do right now. So I think you wanna change how you draft trusts or at least offer clients options to change how you draft trusts. Um, again, the surtax on a trust level kicks in at a fairly low rate. Uh, 200,000 of income, 5% surcharge, half a million of income, 8% surcharge. So this affects, again, not just really, uh, and by the way, this obviously doesn't have an impact on grantor trust, but when the grantor dies, all the grantor trusts become non-grantor, but all the testamentary trusts that are a large part of all the trusts that are out there, uh, credit shelter trusts, uh, et cetera, will all be impacted. A marital trust won't be impacted because it's got to pay all income out, but it may what happens to capital gains and are they trapped at the trust level? Um, keep in mind, this could be a boon for insurance because the growth inside of an insurance policy is not subject to these tax. And if a client wants to retain growth inside the trust and not distribute it all out uh, to avoid the tax, the, the surtaxes, um, you know, PPLI, private placement life insurance, permanent insurance policies with a cash value build up inside the policy could become more popular. Now, the main way you solve this problem is kind of simple, but it does require some different thought about how we plan and, and draft trusts starting right now, because you want to start drafting or at least offering clients the option how to draft to deal proactively with these changes. Trusts, um, uh, as, as most of you probably know, uh, use a, a, a tax system that is very similar to how individuals are taxed, except where there's differences provided in the tax law. And one of the, the most significant differences is a trust gets a deduction 
for distributable net income paid out to a beneficiary. So if I set up a trust and the trust pays out ten thousand dollars to me as a beneficiary, to my son as a beneficiary, and let's say the trust had twelve grand of income, well, if it paid ten grand out, ten grand of the income flows through to my son. He gets the uh, distribution, but he also has 10 grand of income to report on his return. If the trust had a total of 12 grand of income, two grand remains on the trust, 10 grand goes to my son. That that sort of um, based on the fundamental tax concept, I remember way back from my first tax course in, uh, in Wharton, was uh, the, fun, the, the, the wherewithal to pay construct. So in other words, the, the, the tax should be assessed where somebody has the cash flow to pay it. And if the trust paid out, uh, uh, distributable net income. Now the beneficiary, my son in this hypothetical, has the, the the ten grand. He should pay the tax on it. Now, how does that address the surtax? Keep in mind the numbers I gave you earlier. A flesh and blood person doesn't face any surtax until ten million of income, whereas a trust faces a surtax at two hundred grand. Uh, trusts are in the maximum thirty-seven percent tax bracket at thir about thirteen grand of income. Whereas a flesh and blood person, I don't think hits that until like four or 500 grand of income. So merely paying the income out of a non-grantor or complex trust as it's called to the beneficiaries will solve the problem. Maybe, maybe. Now, we should start putting charity in or the ability, if you have the ability to add charities that could make it a grantor trust. And unless that's what you're trying to do or you can do it, uh, that may not be uh, what you want. But when we're structuring trusts, why not have charitable beneficiaries? If there's a really high income tax cost, it may be beneficial to make have the trust make gifts to charity. Now, keep in mind, if you do that, the, in, the, the payment to charity has to come uh, meet the 642C requirements, come from gross income. So you need to address that in the drafting. But I think we're going to see, and we should see, Charities added more frequently to trust, even grantor trust. Why? You may not make the donation now, but when, when the client dies and it becomes a non-grantor trust, having charitable beneficiaries may be a nice safety valve. Is there an advantage to having charitable gifts made out of an irrevocable trust versus from an individual? There can be. As long as you meet the 642C requirements, having a charitable gift made out of the trust is not subject to the standard deduction. A lot of our clients lose a chunk or all of their charitable deductions because the high doubled standard deductions that were enacted in 2017. Year-end planning takes on new meaning. You wanna be very careful if you're an accountant or an attorney that does trust income tax returns. Client shows up in February, gives you the information, but you're too busy with March 15th corporate uh, tax return deadlines and you don't really get to anything on the trust return well, then you've missed the 65 day rule. You can make a payment within the first 65 days of the following year and elect to have it come back and treat it as a distribution from the prior year. So I think it's really important to re-educate clients and they should know this already because of the compressed trust tax rates. Remember I said about 13 grand of income you're in the maximum bracket. We all, investment advisors in particular, accountants, uh, attorneys, we all need to, to, to try to collectively educate our clients. You gotta to talk to your accountant and your wealth advisor if it's securities in December. Don't wait till the end of the year because if these surtaxes are enacted and you have a big sale, the investment advisor is gonna know it because they're, 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 they're involved in your asset allocation and, and whatever sales you may do to liquidate something for another investment or whatever you're doing. The accountant, the wealth advisor need to talk and find out what the tax status of your trust is likely to be a non-grantor trust so you can proactively plan to make distributions. Bottom of page 22, one of the things that I think we need to look at is broadening the class of beneficiaries. Um, the more people that are in the trust, the more people we have that we can make a distribution to. So let's take my hypothetical from a minute ago, trust has 12 grand of income and it gave 10 grand to my son uh, and, and distributes that out to avoid some of the trust income tax. And you could use a number of million if, if you wanted to have the surtax apply. But what if my son lives in California? California's got a 13% income tax. So I may have avoided a 8% surcharge at the trust level, but now the, the beneficiary is paying 13% in state income tax. That's not a winning result. So the broader the class of beneficiaries, because we don't know where people are going to move over the years and the decades that a trust may be in existence, the more flexibility we have to plan. So you got to be careful when you make distributions. Another issue, what if the beneficiary is in the midst of a lawsuit or divorce? 
you want to make a distribution then probably not so trust administration becomes much more complicated you really need to involve the lawyer to understand the terms of what the trust permits to be distributed. You need to involve the accountant to understand not only the trust's income tax status, but the beneficiary's income tax status. And if there's marketable securities in the trust, you got to involve the wealth advisor because you got to know what kind of income you're facing. So it really makes it more complex. You want to make sure there's the ability to include capital gains and income so that you can make those distributions uh, as well. Now, can you wait because, gee, the Senate hasn't done anything? I don't think so. I think you want to start thinking about. Um, I think you want to start thinking about uh, this now. And I think when you're drafting a trust now, knowing the House has enacted that late last year, uh, why not build in the extra flexibility? Now, um, I think if you listen to Lou Reed, the song "Take a Walk on the Wild Side," uh, let, let's take that a step further. I don't have it in the slides, but what if you permit? Um, charitable remainder trusts for beneficiaries to be beneficiaries. So in other words, you could create a charitable remainder trust for the kids and have the payments of income from the trust go into the charitable remainder trust. Charitable remainder trusts are tax exempt. Maybe you kick the income tax uh, cost 20 years down the road if it's a 20 year term charitable remainder trust. Do we wanna start including CRTs as permissible beneficiaries? As long as the CRT has only got the beneficiaries of the trust, it may not be a bad thing. Complex, yes. More costly to operate, yes, but could have a good income tax uh, effect. What about uh, permitting uh, S corporations who are uh, the beneficiaries of uh, the owners of are, are, are um, uh, the same beneficiaries? If, if, if you have S corp stock that owns the underlying assets, and the trust is a quist qualified subchapter S trust. The income is taxed to the beneficiary, but you don't even need to make a distribution because one of the problems with the distribution examples that I gave is a lot of clients may not want to distribute it. The kid um, uh, may be, you know, starting a, 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 maybe the kid's a surgeon and they're worried about malpractice. They're making good money. They don't want to have more assets in their name, keep it protected. Well, with a quist qualified subchapter S trust, the, 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 if the child is a beneficiary, the surgeon child, she can get the income reported on her return, avoid the surtax on the trust level, and not actually have to make a distribution. So there's a lot of creative planning if you want to really take a walk on the wild side. But I think we do need to, to change up and make more robust our trust drafting and planning ideas in light of the House proposal. And if there's no harm in doing it, right, we're just building in the flexibility, kind of why not? Now, this next section is, is really something we've, we've kind of already covered. So I'm just gonna pick and choose a few points to make. Um, I think we have no clue what's gonna happen. I think we should keep planning and advising clients to keep planning. What is the key point in the planning? Second bullet point, appropriate planning. What's appropriate planning? You can't put money into a trust for kids and grandkids you can't access, the client can't access, unless they have so much wealth that they're never going to need to access it. Never is kind of a strong term. I mean, unless there's overwhelming evidence that the client is never going to need the money, why on earth not use trusts that permit access? How do you permit access? Well, everyone knows SLAT, Spousal Lifetime Access Trust. What if the client's single? They can do a domestic asset protection trust where they're a beneficiary of their own trust. You're concerned that you live in New York or another non-DAPT jurisdiction and maybe the DAPT domestic asset protection self-settled trust set up in Nevada uh, won't, won't be respected in New York. Uh, first, keep in mind, there's now 19 states that accept DAPT. So this is not an anomaly anymore, not, not for a while. And I suspect the number of states that accept them will grow beyond the 19. Um, but you could have a fuse. Most of the, the cases where DAPs have been pierced or challenged successfully, and they're very few, They've been under the bankruptcy law where someone declares bankruptcy. So obviously, if you don't declare bankruptcy, that shouldn't happen. But the bankruptcy, the trustee in bankruptcy um, under Co uh, Bankruptcy uh, uh, Act 548E, I believe is the section, can uh, disavow or pierce a self-settled trust or similar device. I, we still don't know what that means within 10 years of its funding and formation. So if you have a fuse in the DAP that the client can't get distributions for 10 years in a day, 
maybe you circumvented that. You could use a hybrid DAPT where the client's not a beneficiary of the DAPT today, but somebody can add them back in in a non-fiduciary capacity. So the point is what's appropriate planning? Preserving access. How do you show that you got appropriate planning? Get financial forecasts, have the wealth advisor do financial forecasts. Here's what the numbers look like. Um, another thing you do, you, you, you make sure that when it's appropriate, you have a robust insurance plan. I tell every client, bar none, that when they're doing any kind of sophisticated trust planning, have your insurance consultant give you some projections. If you're doing, for example, non-reciprocal slats, husband sets up trust for wife, wife sets up trust for husband. If the spouse dies, there's no access to the trust they set up. Buy life insurance on the other spouse. If each trust includes uh, an insurance policy you've protected against mortality risk. What about disability insurance? If the client's working still, and they are putting a, a large swath of half of their wealth into these trust to use exemption before it goes down in 2026. Why not make sure they have a strong disability insurance policy? Why not make sure they have a good long-term care policy? They may not have wanted that coverage before, but if they're moving half of their wealth into an irrevocable trust, even if they have access, why on earth not give them the belt and suspenders and more protection? Um, I think it makes sense to use all of these techniques. Now, there have been proposals. I'm not going to go through them because I, I just don't see them getting enacted, but you don't know. Remember my earlier comment from Keebler, Bride of Frankenstein. You don't know what they may pluck out to make numbers work. Um, Sanders had proposed capping gifts to insurance trust at twice the annual exclusion. Now it's 16000 per donate. Well, for anyone that's got a large insurance plan, that's going to absolutely hamstring the plan. You're going to have to use uh, premium financing and or um, split dollar insurance to make that plan work. Well, if the client's got excess exemption and everyone does, right? Because there's 90,000 in new exemption. Why not front load pre-fund some of those insurance trusts right now? It's good asset protection planning. And if the law changes, they've taken care of it. If they can afford to do it, if it's appropriate, why not do it? By the way, another, another planning step that, and this is, let's call this, I wish I'd made the list up because I, I kind of like this. Uh, another way to get clients in the door this year and another step that should be looked at uh, that I, I find has been overlooked in a lot of cases. So you may have a client and they came in in 2020 or 2021 and you set up some pretty modern, good quality, non-reciprocal spousal lifetime access trusts. We've always thrown in insurance provisions, right? A separate insurance trustee and insurance powers in those slats because why not? They're really just robust islets, insurance trusts, right? A slat's not necessarily all that different than an islet. So we've always built in insurance provisions. The reason you kind of need a separate insurance trustee, and many of them, a lot of our clients own closely held businesses and they want to be named the investment trustee, investment advisor, investment director, whatever you call it. Uh, and they can't have the powers over insurance or under 2042, it's included back in their estate. So we build insurance provisions into the slats. And if you don't have it, you can maybe get it through a trust protector action depending on state law, but if not, decant the trust and add insurance provisions. It's only an administrative change. But by doing that, you can now take these old islets. Lots of our clients have lousy old insurance trusts. And when I say lousy, that's unfair because they may have been state-of-the-art when they were done, but the state-of-the-art insurance trust 10 years ago had all the money paid out to the kid at age 30. So you destroy GST benefits, even if there were GST uh, allocations, which there probably weren't. You destroy the asset protection and you undermine the, asset, the, the estate planning and everything else. So one of the things to do is you can take these old insurance trusts, have the old, not so good quality trust, sell the policy to the new slat, and you may have to decant the slat first. You get rid of the old trust. Clients will love having less trust. There won't be a need to ever make again another annual gift or issue another crummy power because the slat has money in it. They can pay the premiums, right? Because you put in millions of dollars to use exemptions. You've cleaned it up and given now a GST exemption structure around the insurance. What do you do with the old islet? What we've done is just sold the policies for a note, distribute the notes to the kid, killed the old islet. Client has one less trust. Everything's in, in the new trust. They have no uh, annual gifts, no crummy powers. It's all much easier. So that's, that's another item you can go look back to and do. Um, slide 28 is really not different than anything I've been saying for the last two years. Uh, just kind of obvious stuff. You, you got to protect yourself from retroactive tax change. I don't think it's going to happen, but we don't know. 
you got to preserve access. We've talked about it. It's silly not to use exemption for anyone with any substantive wealth because it could go down. And hey, by the way, one of the lessons I think of all these harsh tax proposals, and, and I'm not going to predict politics. I don't know who's going to win in the midterms next year. I don't know who's going to win the next election, but everything goes through cycles. Now that the cat's out of the bag and all these harsh proposals like eliminating basis step up deemed realization have been proposed and talked about, and there's obviously a large chunk of the country that wants to tax wealthy people with those restrictions, that stuff may happen again. It may happen again. So now that we know that's on the drawing board, why not plan? Um, we've talked about all that. So the escape valves, I have some more detail here on it. Uh, we've kind of talked about it. Um, I think you want to make sure that you build in disclaimer provisions. There's several ways to do it. Some practitioners, like everything we all do as estate planners, there's some people that say it doesn't work and it's a disaster. Some people say it works great. There's other people that say it's, uh, yeah, yeah. how could you do it? not do it? Um, you know, there's never any, any agreement. But one approach is you designate somebody as a primary beneficiary and give them the power to disclaim. So I create a trust, a spousal lifetime access trust for my wife and all descendants. I give my oldest son, Jonathan, the designation of being the primary beneficiary. If he disclaims within nine months of a transfer to the trust, I deem that to be a disclaimer on behalf of all beneficiaries in the trust. And then I can further go, and it seems like the 2518 regs permit this, and say that if Jonathan disclaims, those assets don't continue in the trust as if he predeceased, which is the typical consequence of a disclaimer, but rather those assets all revert back to me as the set law and it's over. So look at, look at some of this, and there's some more detail here, which we can skip, and rescission as well. You want to look at it again. Let me just tell you in the last minute, because then I'll, I'll turn it back to Jonathan to wrap up. Everyone knows what slats are. You got to be really careful. The Smaldino case shot down um, uh, a transfer. It wasn't a slap, but it had uh, uh, too little time for a step transaction issue with a transfer from one spouse to the next and into a trust. Be very careful when you're retitling assets between spouses. And for all the accountants out there, I would report these spousal transfers on gift tax returns. I think it's a mistake not to. Um, and I also think you've got to warn people about the risk of divorce because it's going to remain a grant or trust as noted on slide 41. Think about using self-settled trusts. Uh, I know that they are clearly viewed as more risky but it gives you more um, uh, access. So if I set up a trust for my wife and descendants, if my wife predeceases or divorces me, I have no access to the trust I set up. Why not make it adapt? Or if you think that's uh, too risky, make it a hybrid adapt. Uh, and then there's this concept called a spat where instead of adding me back as a beneficiary, I give my college roommate, Joe, the ability to direct the trustee to make a, a payment to me. It's really just a limited or special power of appointment, which we've used in planning for a very long time, only it's back to the set law. That's another approach that can be used. And I think really what you want to do is mix and match, right? Because we have issues and concerns about the reciprocal trust doctrine. Why do two non-reciprocal slats? Why not do a slat and adapt, adapt and a spat, a spat and a, and a hybrid adapt? Mix them up. It gives you more access, more differentiation for the reciprocal trust doctrine. That's something I haven't seen nearly enough uh, done. And if you're in New York, as an example, you don't want to do these trusts there. You probably want to go to a better jurisdiction that has self settled trust provisions. You can go to Connecticut, Ohio, Alaska, Nevada. There's 19 states that permit it. But I think if we do more robust planning, we can give the clients more access. They're more comfortable doing the planning. And uh, we can build in some of these things. Uh, other ways to give access into the trust, and I'll kind of wrap up with this. You can include tax reimbursement clause, loan provisions, floating spouse provisions, add charitable beneficiaries, ability of the trust expressly to hold personal use assets like a home or vacation home. Lots of things we can do to provide access. Uh, I'm gonna skip the rest of this because we're out of time. There's some slides there. I think uh, number one issue for most of us is how are we gonna get clients to engage in conversation because they're burnt out and tired of planning and sick of hearing uh, us tell them that the tax laws could all change, but they could, we don't know. So I've tried to give you, I think five practical tips on how to change up the conversation to get clients to engage. Think of the Smoldino case and formality. We should all circle back and get clients to address formality. Be proactive with clients, circle back and address a lot of the core planning that's been ignored for the last 18 months. And good luck. And maybe sometime soon we'll actually know what the tax law is gonna be. Jonathan, back to you to wrap up. Great, thank you so much. 
Um, if anyone has any specific questions, new business opportunities, any other issues they'd like to discuss, please feel free to reach out directly to Martin or myself where appropriate. I'll be sure to include his contact information in the follow-up email to this program. I'll also send out the handouts again tomorrow morning. They were already sent out in the reminder email prior to this program, I'll be sure to send out again tomorrow. As I mentioned at the onset, the goal of these programs is to stay up to date on timely wealth management related topics and to collaborate where appropriate. I think we can all agree that the clients who are best prepared are the ones who are served by a team of knowledgeable advisors. Two more quick items before I let you go. First, my next program will be on Tuesday, January 18th on charitable remainder trusts, planning options for clients with existing CRTs featuring Evan Unzelman, president of Sterling Foundation Management. Second, please take 30 seconds to fill out the survey at the end of this program. It helps me improve my webinars and provide timely and interesting content to attendees. I thank you in advance. And with that, this concludes today's session. Please stay safe, healthy, and have a wonderful day and year, everybody. Have a good day.